Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Mary Koshi. I'm with the Office for Diversity and Inclusion. I want to take care of some housekeeping stuff before I introduce our speaker for today's virtual talk. We have closed captioning available to you today. So if you could go to, if you don't see it showing up, there's a closed a CC icon at the bottom of your toolbar. Um, you could go there and select show subtitles. And secondly, we have the Q&A function available as well. And feel free to ask your questions and enter your comments throughout the session. And we will um, try to answer them during the presentation. And if we don't get to them, we will definitely leave time at the end to um, respond to your questions. And so with that, um, welcome to our virtual speaker series to raise disability awareness. And today we have with us Dr. Carl Street Jr., who's assistant professor at Boston University School of Medicine. This event today is sponsored by the ADAPT ERG, all differing abilities partnering together and the LGBTQ ERG. So welcome everybody. So I, I'll give you some introduction about um, Dr. Street today. Um, he is an assistant professor at Boston University School of Medicine. After attending medical school and residency in internal medicine at Johns Hopkins, he completed fellowship in general internal medicine at Brigham Women's. And nationally, he has chaired the American Medical Association Advisory Committee on LGBTQ issues, served on the board of GLMA, Health Professionals Advancing LGBTQ Equality, and currently serves on the board of the US Professional Association for Transgender Health. Carl's efforts to improve the health and well being of sexual and gender minority individuals and communities have earned him several awards notably from the University of Chicago and Johns Hopkins University Alumni Associations, the American Medical Association Foundation, the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, as well as recognition from the Obama White House. As the research lead for the Center for Transgender Medicine and Surgery at Boston Medical College, he collaborates with researchers, clinicians, and staff to assess and address the health and well-being of transgender and gender diverse individuals. The topic for today's talk is disparities among LGBTQ persons with disabilities. Welcome, Dr. Street. Great. Thank you so much uh, for that introduction. It always feels awkward hearing that. <laughs> and um, so I want to first start first. Um, I'm a bit of a fast talker. I gave Mary a heads up about that. So please feel free to put questions in the Q&A. Feel free to um, um, we'll be answering them as we go, as well as there will be plenty of time for Q&A at the end. I'm going to see if I still remember how to use Zoom and pull up my presentation. Great. Uh, Mary, can you just give me a thumbs up that you see just the title slide? Yes, you're good. Great. Thank you. I always want to confirm because sometimes you never know. Um, I'm going to hide that. So great. So let's get started. So again, I'm Carl, uh, pronouns he, him, his. I am going to do my best to cover some recent research that we had publication on the disparities among LGBTQ persons with disabilities. Um, I always like to highlight this is a research project. There are a lot of limitations. We'll talk about the limitations. Um, this is really just meant as kind of a snapshot as to what's being done now and what uh, where we need to be going next. So by way of this being uh, standard uh, disclosures you heard a lot about in terms of what I'm involved in. These are uh, organizations that I have some sort of role in. I also have funding from the NIH and the American Heart Association. I always like to highlight that. Um, also, I think um, a lot of what we try to do is really right wrongs, um, uh, both, both past, present, and ongoing. So part of that includes, um, I think is important, land acknowledgments. It's, kind of, it's, un, it's important to understand kind of the longstanding history um, that has brought us to reside on the lands we're on. So I am in Boston. I am occupying lands of the Massachusetts tribe. This is one of the first steps in trying to address wrongs. It is not the only step. So land acknowledgments have to go further. Um, and then I also like to thank my uh, collaborators on the current research that I'm going to be presenting, Dr. Hall, Boyd, Batsa, and uh, Noel Kurth. 
um, I like to highlight that it's a unique team and that um, I'm coming in from a clinical perspective as the uh, physician of the group. Uh, a lot of folks are psychologists and, and other PhD trained folks and Dr. Batza is a historian. Uh, so we try to come at this from a lot of different angles to understand what's going on as it relates to disability and um, LGBTQI identities. And then, of course, the standard disclaimer, uh, this work is funded uh, by the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living, and Rehabilitation Research. Um, and the standard, of course, goes that I'm not speaking for the government or for our funders, but we thank them for their support. Now, I get the impression I'm talking to a crowd that's already very savvy about terminology as it relates to broadly sexual and gender minority um, identities, um, LGBTQIA+, and essentially anything that is not straight or cisgender. Um, I like using these graphics just to kind of ground a lot of the ways I think about these concepts so folks can understand where I'm coming from. The image on the left is from Mayo Clinic. It's a good way of just noting how all of these factors around sexual orientation, gender identity, um, sex, gender expression are part of an individual. Everybody has the these um, components of who they are, even our straight cisgender colleagues, they have a sex, a gender identity, a sexual, uh, a gender expression, a sexual orientation. Um, and this really kind of highlights the ways in which that, could, um, that we need to really account for all of these factors when we're, uh, when we're talking about populations. The image on the right is from the updated um, gender unicorn. I like it the most uh, in terms of it moves away from binaries. It moves away from the notion that male is in opposition to female or masculine is in opposition to feminine um, and really highlighting that, uh, in fact, you can have multiple components of these in addition to other ones that are not rooted in a Western or colonial perspective of masculine and feminine alone. So just making sure we're all on the same page, gender identity, internal sense of self as it relates to your gender. Gender expression is the social and cultural cues we use to signal our gender identity. And again, I really stress that this is socially and culturally derived. Um, I like sharing the story of an episode of Comedy, Central, uh, Comedy Central's um, uh, daily show with Trevor Noah. Trevor Noah had a guest on, Jacob Tobiah, who is a non-binary activist, author, and actor. Um, and they brought um, to the set an earring for Trevor Noah. They wanted to help Trevor Noah essentially um, uh, trans their gender. And Trevor Noah puts it on, uh, kind of uh, uh, vogues with it a little bit and really highlights like, this is great because you know what, in, in my culture where I grew up, my grandmother would be like, oh, it's so great that you're being a man because wearing an earring for them was masculine. So again, recognizing the social and cultural uh, cues um, uh, and uh, where we derive that when we are trying to do gender expression. Sex assigned at birth, most commonly what we're taught in medical school and other health professions as male and female, but we know that is not actually the full story. We know about differences in sex development and intersex status. And then sexual orientation is around physical attraction, emotional attraction, as well as behavior um, as it relates to that. And then I've highlighted and you notice in the title and you'll notice as I'm talking uh, some tension between person first language and identity first language. Um, the American Psychological Association and other organizations really try to put person first. So when we talk about people with disabilities, um, but I think there's more of a, a, an appropriate move towards identity first. This really tries to promote autonomy among people um, and really allow folks to self-identify how um, these relate to their identity. Um, identity first approaches um, instead of person first approaches in a way kind of counter the criticism that um, person first can be a little patronizing um, and, and make disability sound strictly negative. Um, so instead of saying somebody with autism, some, uh, a lot of organizations say autistic persons. Uh, so I wanna just highlight that there is this, there might uh, this sensation of tension around this. At the end of the day, it's really about how people want to identify and we should continue to mirror that um, and use the language that they use. So let's talk about some numbers. How many people um, identify as LGB and T? Um, this is the latest data from Gallup. This is adults um, answering phone calls, essentially uh, when somebody asks them, which of the following do you consider yourself to be? And then selecting straight, heterosexual, lesbian, gay, bi, or trans. Um, again, they're putting all the, all the categories together. Um, but what we have is a increasing number of adults in the US identifying as LGB and or T. Um, now, most recently at 5.6%. Um, a lot of folks like to say this is a reflection of, um, well, folks on the right and folks that we, we are trying to convince or address like to say this is a reflection of contagion. Um, but in fact, this is more likely a reflection of society doing better. And we know, um, in fact, that when youth actually have supportive environments, they're uh, more likely to come out at younger ages. Um, and then, of course, highlighting differences across generations. Uh, I want to really uh, draw people's attention here to a bit of a drop off between baby boomer, Gen X and millennials. 
in terms of the number of folks identifying as LGB or T. Um, of course, this is a reflection of those generations having more support uh, at, at specific times in their coming up. But I also want to make sure that we're not forgetting about the impact of the HIV epidemic um, on the lived experience of uh, individuals. So this, I think, is really helpful to consider because the number of LGBTQ folks moving forward is going to continue to rise as society uh, is more welcoming and as people actually have community and support uh, to be able to more fully express their uh, sexual and gender identity. Now, of course, what's happening for LGBTQ folks within healthcare? Um, there's been a lot of surveys, one of the more recent ones uh, done in 2017, and that already feels forever ago uh, with the pandemic, um, since time has no meaning, it feels like. Um, and so this is done by the National Public Radio, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, looking at the overall experience of all um, uh, U.S. adults uh, across a variety of factors. This is their uh, takeaway for LGBTQ Americans. Um, and what they really found was that the numbers are still high in terms of the number of LGBTQ folks reporting being personally discriminated against discriminated against uh, because of their identity uh, when trying to access health care. I always find this quite um, abhorrent in terms of being in a profession that is designed to care for folks, having about 16% um, say that they are not able to access care because of the system itself. We see about one in five trans individuals avoiding uh, uh, clinical care for concern of discrimination. Um, and then, of course, as a result, a third have no regular form of health care. Um, I do want to highlight that NPR did a good job of digging a little bit more into their own data on this and really did some good reporting as it relates to access um, and issues in rural settings. So again, making sure that we're not only focused on um, the urban environment, where a lot of work has been done um, over the years as it relates to LGBTQ um, health and access to services. And then, of course, we know that there have been issues with the last administration uh, as it relates to even allowing um, uh, care to be provided to LGBTQ individuals. The last administration really tried to codify ways of um, allowing uh, clinicians and the healthcare system to discriminate against LGBTQ folks, among other categories and other services. Um, thankfully, that has changed. The current context uh, in the current administration is favorable. Uh, we are definitely seeing a lot of great, uh, great work, and uh, we can uh, attribute that to particularly careerists who've been there the whole time, who've really tried keeping, uh, right, keeping the boat moving forward, um, as it were, um, during hostile times during the last administration. But also great to see that Dr. Now Admiral uh, Rachel Levine uh, uh, having a significant role within HHS. But of course, this is in the same context of what's happening at the state level. I can't uh, neglect to mention issues as it relates to anti-trans bills in terms of access to uh, public accommodations, restrooms, access to sports as youth, access to even healthcare uh, for youth. So this is still happening elsewhere. Um, thankfully, um, we're able to, within Boston, yourself in New York, uh, be in a more supportive environment, but I wanna make sure we're not forgetting about um, everyone um, uh, elsewhere who more than likely are trying to come to us. Much more could be said about LGBTQ health and populations and particularly issues around social determinants of health. Um, the more recent uh, National Academy's report on understanding the well-being of LGBTQI plus populations goes into great depth. I don't wanna uh, 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 keep throwing too many statistics at you um, at this point, but I encourage you to really look at this. There are some great executive summaries as well based on specific topics and many talks are still happening in terms of summarizing what this report shows as well as the next steps to not only understanding the well-being, but actually improving the well-being of LGBTQI plus populations. So I've talked about LGBTQ populations. Let's talk about um, uh, adults uh, as um, the CDC def uh, defines as living with disabilities. So about one in four adults in the US have some uh, disability as they describe it. Um, what they do is, so, and that translate, translates into roughly 60 million adults um, and if, uh, they make note in the uh, Morbidity and Mortality Weekly report from 2018 that a larger percentage of folks um, uh, with living with disability are located in uh, the south, southeast of the U.S. This is the breakdown based on issues regarding functional disability in terms of being able to get around, um, being able to concentrate or remember uh, making decisions, uh, concerns around independent living, having difficulty managing uh, errands and um, activities uh, to maintain your household, as it were, issues around hearing and vision, and then difficulty uh, bathing and dressing. Um, this is These are the standard categories they use, particularly as it relates to the behavioral risk factor surveillance system, which is one of the larger older uh, surveillance systems we have in the US. Um, so as you can see, pretty much broad uh, set of categories here. Um, I do wanna highlight that disability, um, uh, and noting 
earlier the um, difference in LGBTQ uh, identity across generations, making note that uh, disability um, is associated with age um, and that uh, at least in terms of the statistics. So we have two and five adults, uh, 65 and older having disabilities, so higher than the general population, uh, making note that according to the CDC, their category for women, which as I read it really means cisgender women, one in four cisgender women have disability. And then also noting disabilities based on race, uh, ethnicity, uh, marginalized populations in the US. Big issues as it relates to particularly certain chronic conditions, including um, uh, uh, heart disease, diabetes, um, but also behaviors as it relates that are risk factors for that, including smoking and alcohol use. Um, I hesitate to say smoking um, is like a, a, the way I approach a number of risk behaviors is thinking about what are, what are the upstream of uh, factors that are motivating that. A lot of this is stress. If you are having trouble accessing services, if you are having issues with how society treats you, you may engage in, in coping mechanisms that have been targeted to you, um, uh, including smoking. So I, has, I, I, I worry about the way statistics are presented around smoking sometimes because it, makes you, it puts blame on people when in fact it is a coping mechanism in a stressful society that is not meeting their needs. So I do wanna highlight that smoking is a, uh, does occur more, um, is a higher self-report among people living with disabilities in, the, in these statistics. And then of Carl, course, the big- I, Sorry, yep. I do have a question. That yeah, please. Um, before you move on to the next slide, do the disability statistics include mental illness? No, so that's a great question. So these are, these are um, within the MMWR, within the Morbidity and Mortality Report, they only function, they only focused really on functional disability and health conditions related to those fun, uh, functional uh, disabilities. They did not look into mental um, uh, disabilities classified as uh, relating to mental health. Um, we make a point of talking a little bit about that in our own research, uh, but yes, thank you for that question for clarifying. Um, this is still very much focused on physical um, disability, which um, I, we can have a much longer conversation about how that is missing a large portion of um, people's lived experience and, and what we need to do to meet their needs. Was there a follow-up question to that? I just want to make sure. No, not at this time. Okay, okay thank you. Um, and then um, I just want to highlight uh, among uh, adults 18 to uh, 44, about one in three have no source of usual care. Uh, one in three um, have unmet needs as a result due to uh, issues with cost. And then about a quarter of um, uh, adults uh, reporting a functional disability um, have not had a, even a routine check in the past year. And I will, I will say as a primary care doctor that really is discouraging because I can't even begin to address preventive health needs if people aren't able to access um, uh, uh, preventive health services in the first place. So let's look a little bit at some data that um, exists, uh, that has existed in the past few years, looking at the intersection of uh, persons uh, with disabilities and uh, LGBTQ folks. So this is from the Movement Advancement Project. This is their consolidated report from 2018, really highlighting what, they, uh, what we best knew at that time um, as it relates to uh, self-reportive disability among LGBTQ uh, folks. Um, I want to make note just when I say LGBT or LGBTQ, I, I do my best to try and say what the research um, or what the data was available said. So Movement Advancement Project used LGBT. They note that two in five of trans adults reported some disability, about one in four LGB adults, um, uh, noting that they were using California data. And then these percentages, 40% uh, percent of bisexual men, 36 of lesbian women, 36 of bisexual women, and 26 of gay men, was coming from the behavioral risk factor surveillance system within Washington state. Um, and I, um, I'm a fan of, I'm, I like these reports. They do a great job in terms of providing infographics and really consolidating what's there. It's always worth drilling down a little bit and trying to understand where these numbers are coming from as it relates to those percentages on the right in particular. Um, this is actually uh, work done by uh, Dr. Fredrickson Goldson um, using, um, uh, they are like prolific as it relates to early um, uh, LGBTQ uh, research using uh, population data from Washington state. So I wanna highlight just this top row, all those percentages that I, I cited from the Movement Advancement Project come from this, uh, this line alone. And uh, what they tried doing, and you can see this data is actually already uh, nearly a decade old from 2012, is trying to understand additional factors that play into disability. And again, here, this is still really focusing a lot on physical um, dis uh, disability, but you'll notice on the bottom, at least, the inclusion of the question as it relates to mental distress. And um, the mental distress, so frequent mental distress was still uh, more common among uh, lesbian women, uh, still more common among bisexual women, and then the same goes for gay and bisexual men uh, compared to their heterosexual counterparts. 
I make note um, that this is still focusing just on LGD individuals. Uh, the behavioral risk factor surveillance system within Washington state did not have uh, appropriate questions as it relates to gender identity to actually capture um, the true, uh, the full spectrum of uh, gender and gender identity. Um, Dr. Ferguson Goldson um, actually went on then to try and understand what are some other factors that could be playing into people's report of disability or issues as it relates to physical and mental uh, distress. So these are adjusted models, um, including not only um, looking at uh, and making sure we account for age, but also accounting for a number of other factors that, uh, uh, that were just presented, including asthma, arthritis, smoking, um, inability or uh, difficulty accessing uh, recommended physical activity levels and so forth. What you can see in these kind of models is when you try to account for other things that we know could be playing a role in disability, there's still a significant difference based on self-reported sexual identity. And what this means is there's something else going on out there that we're missing that we really need to try and better understand. Um, so this, as you can see, is data from 2003, five, seven, and nine. So there hasn't been a whole lot of updated information um, looking at the experience of LGB and T folks as it relates to disability um, in the US. Um, so that's why I'm appreciative of additional work uh, that we has been done so we can even begin to present some of the research that I'm going to show you. Uh, but I also want to just highlight uh, uh, quickly an issue around access. I highlighted earlier um, both within the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report as well as what the Movement Advancement Project highlighted issues around even accessing services. Within the Movement Advancement Project, they had done a, a good review of all the LGBT community centers in the US and just seeing what were some uh, of the accessible services. Here you can see um, only three, just nearly three quarters had accessible restrooms or fountains, um, issues around parking, um, and then particularly as it relates to braille signs, materials, um, and other touch tone um, uh, services to help as it relates to, again, physical uh, disabilities as reported by them. So let's talk a little bit about the National Survey on Health and Dis uh, Disability. So this is um, uh, administered by University of Kansas, um, as I noted through their funding. Um, uh, what they have done essentially is an online survey as well as a phone option to make sure we're trying to capture as many folks as possible and allowing as many ways people can respond. Um, it is a convenient sample, um, so it is, not a pop, it is not a probability sample, so we can't make too many broad generalizations. And it has been done um, uh, with input before, during, and in subsequent uh, iterations from a number of um, uh, organizations and associations that come at this from their own identity with regards to disability. Um, they've tried to address comparisons across uh, across the U.S. in terms of trying to use weighting from the census. Um, I am hesitant uh, to use that when we talk about marginalized populations, which thankfully uh, the, uh, the NSHD has oversampled. And then they also do a good job of trying to make sure they use multiple measures of disability. So they use um, the US Census Bureau's American Community Survey questions, the ACS, as well as the United Nations Washington Group Short Set Questions, the WGSS. And these questions are, um, they also make sure that there's always an option for an open-ended category. So how people can self-identify what their disability is. Um, they work with them, their own internal group of experts around disability care and access, as well as lived experience to then categorize them. And I'll show you those categories um, uh, here in terms of including uh, mental health, physical disability, intellectual or developmental disability, sensory, neurological, and then chronic illness as well. These are the broad categories that were um, uh, uh, broken down from expert opinion as well as community input. These are the numbers in terms of the different waves that have been uh, run so far. So 2018 had 1,200, uh, 2019 into 2020 uh, got us uh, over the 2,000 uh, mark. And then they actually have 2021 data that they are still working on right now. And you can see that about 566 folks have been part of all three waves, which is great in terms of providing some longitudinal data opportunities. Um, the data that I'm going to show, though, is going to be focusing in 2018 through 2020. We were looking at this before the pandemic, uh, just to kind of get an idea around access issues. We have an interest, and we will be looking at what, uh, how the pandemic has actually affected um, LGBTQ folks with disabilities as well at a later date. And just so you know, these are some of the uh, uh, some of the data that's out there right now. Um, I'll be talking about um, number three, so characteristics of sexual and gender minority respondents. Um, but you can also note that we've done some work looking at the experience of sexual and gender minority folks with um, autism spectrum uh, disorder. So, um, and you'll be able to, I'll share these slides, but I just wanna make sure you know what the webpage is. This, this data is available to outside researchers. This data is something that you can actually collaborate on and ask your own questions. So I always wanna make sure people know that this is not something that is um, 
only for only for a select group of folks to really answer. So let's dive into what actually got me invited here. Um, uh, and again, I appreciate uh, you inviting me uh, based on this research. Sometimes as an academic, you put things out there and hope people read it. And I, I appreciate that at least one, one or two folks have so far. So uh, we'll talk about comparative health status and characteristics of our respondents from the 2019-2020 uh, wave of the NSHD. Um, in terms of how folks are identified, I just wanna I'll share this. So, and we can talk about this in limitations because I, I have some uh, issues with how the questions were asked. Uh, uh, we do the best we can with what we get. So first of all, respondents after they are identified as having a disability within those categories that I initially presented, respondents are asked, what is your sexual orientation? And they are given the options of gay, lesbian, or homosexual, given straight or heterosexual, bisexual, something else, and they can actually write it in asexual or prefer not to answer. And then respondents were also asked, what is your gender? Responses included male, female, other, and those choosing other were asked to please specify. And then the write-in was then categorized as, a, as transgender, non-binary, two-spirit, gender non-conforming, gender queer, agender, and intersex. Um, in terms of how this got grouped together within the internal team uh, before I got to it was essentially they grouped all sexual and gender minority folks together. Not able to really tease that fully apart uh, at this point. Um, and that is something we can talk a little bit in the Q&A about uh, major limitations, particularly around the gender question, um, but making sure that we are not excluding folks who self-identify as, um, as a gender identity within the categories that, we, that we're interested in. So what we got then from our sample is about 472 um, broadly sexual and gender minority identified folks versus, uh, compared to non-SGM, so straight cisgender. I may highlight here just some differences in terms of uh, the uh, mean age, the SGM group uh, typically being younger, which is not uncommon in a lot of population level research. And then seeing big, uh, some differences across racial and ethnic uh, uh, self-identified categories. And noticing uh, differences in terms of socioeconomic status. So uh, SGM, our SGM sample actually um, uh, more likely to complete a four-year college degree. Um, having uh, naturally issues as it relates to household income. And this is based on self-reported income as well as their zip code. So we make sure that it's uh, appropriately calculated federal poverty level, but no, not a whole uh, big difference uh, statistically, at least in terms of uninsured status. Here are all those disability categories that they had presented and noting here uh, differences between the, uh, our two groups. So highlighting uh, more likely self-reported mental illness or psychiatric um, uh, illness as it relates to disability, uh, no, uh, no significant difference in physical uh, or chronic conditions, but noting differences as it relates to intellectual disability, cognitive or self-report of uh, autism spectrum. Um, no difference in terms of any sensory disability, differences though in terms of uh, any neurologic uh, condition and then the, the multiple uh, disabilities uh, self being self-reported here. I want to highlight here some key differences um, as it relates to among those who have reported no insurance and for both SGM and non-SGM groups. What are some differences in terms of their ability to access care? Um, as you can see here from the P, uh, our P column, which is looking for statistical differences between the two groups, the only big difference, uh, the only difference that uh, we could find was that um, the inability to get access to mental health services um, among those who are uninsured. Uh, so what this really shows is that uninsurance, uh, not having insurance sucks for everyone. And fortunately, in the, healthcare, in the U.S. healthcare system, where we are so focused on um, this patchwork of public and private and other forms of insurance, um, that not having any um, is just a major detriment to being able to access services and that there wasn't a big difference based on sexual and gender identity uh, within our study. What was fascinating and what I'd like to highlight is that when we are insured, when people have access to some form of insurance, there are major differences between the ability to access um, uh, basics, such as just having seen a doctor in the last year, getting access to prescriptions, specialty care, dental services, which are a whole other conversation about why we have dental services separate in the US, um, but being able to access preventive care, mental health services, being even able to access um, uh, your specific medical equipment um, based on a, a certain dis, uh, disability status. Um, and then of course, in a, an adequate provider network. So insurance did not, um, in this group of people who reported a disability, SGM folks fared worse 
even if they were insured compared to straight cisgender folks who were insured. Um, we're trying to really tease this out and we have some qualitative data um, that is currently being uh, analyzed and looking for themes and so forth. But it's been, it, this was like the most unexpected finding um, from our study. And we can talk a little bit more about that at the end as well. Um, and then I just wanna highlight some of the key um, outcomes that are often um, a focus within population uh, surveys such as this, very similar to the behavioral risk factor surveillance system, looking at self-report of poor fair health, severe mental distress, and then days um, uh, self-report in terms of physical or mental unhealthy and then activity being limited as a result of any of those conditions. So again, SGM compared to non-SGM, these are the unadjusted numbers initially. So you can see here, um, there's a uh, unadjusted, there's a difference between SGM and non-SGM as it relates to severe mental distress. Again, very consistent with what we've seen even just a decade ago. Big issues in terms of the number of mentally unhealthy days, self-reported mentally unhealthy days um, uh, between the two groups in terms of like a, 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 about a three day difference. So a third of a month a difference. Um, and then, Sorry, it's 10th of a month, I can't even do math right now. Um, and then a big difference in terms of activity limitation. Naturally, we try to account for some factors that play into that. So we did control for, um, we did account in our models for um, age, insurance status. Um, we did look at uh, disability type to make sure we were uh, comparing it across that. And then uh, smoking, which was recommended by one of our experts to make sure we're including smoking as, a, as accounting for this. What happens here is severe mental distress um, uh, is not statistically different between the two groups, but everything else is. So self-report of poor fear health is different between um, SGM and non-SGM folks uh, with disabilities. Big difference in terms of number of physical days, mentally unhealthy days, or activity limited days as a result of this. What this leads to for me is just way more questions um, as with a lot of this population research is when we try to account for factors that we know that relate to these outcomes and there's still a difference, something else is missing, something else is unmeasured as it relates to um, uh, uh, LGBTQI uh, identity. So naturally, I, I think good research leads to more questions. We're really trying to understand what's going on, particularly among the insured population. Um, because uh, a lot of what's happening, we think in terms of some of the qualitative data is you have insurance, great. You can go access your services, but then they're not competent in providing care to LGBTQ individuals, let alone as it relates to disability status, uh, different disability statuses, or even providing uh, appropriate diagnoses. That's what a lot has come out in the qualitative data so far. Um, that is publication pending more in terms of what else is coming from that. Uh, but then of course, making sure that as a result of that, we, we were starting to really push folks to have more of a multidisciplinary team around this, making sure that you're not just throwing people off to specialists and leaving it up to them to try and actually uh, maintain that contact or make those connections. And then I, for folks who know me, and uh, this is a bit of one of my other um, areas of work is really trying to expand education among the health professions as it relates to um, LGBTQ health. Um, in the qualitative data, as I mentioned, a lot of folks are noting that clinicians, staff, institutions in general just are not um, making the environment welcoming and are not able to address um, a lot of uh, uh, physical and mental health issues as it relates to LGBTQI uh, identity. And then of course, this relates just to the ADA, we need to do better in terms of uh, uh, addressing a number of issues. The Movement Advancement Project highlighted just basic issues in terms of access to LGBTQ health centers, which we like to think are a little bit further ahead, but like still having issues in terms of uh, maintaining uh, physical access. And then uh, the National Academies report, I think really does a good job of highlighting that we have a lot of, uh, a lot we have to address as it relates to socioeconomic, social determinants health, particularly as it relates, uh, relates to making sure there's equitable pay um, for folks uh, uh, living with disabilities. And then of course, advancing uh, legal recourse for, fo uh, for folks in this, I'm sure everyone on this call has heard, making sure that we push for the Equality Act. Um, as, um, and then uh, again, talking about improved uh, accessibility uh, to community health centers, making sure there's paid time and uh, uh, leave as a primary care doctor. The number of hurdles that are put in place for folks uh, with uh, living with disability is remarkable. Uh, the amount of uh, red tape that people have to go through is kind of ridiculous. And we're actually trying to figure out, at least within our state society, ways to try and minimize that, both from, um, from the clinician's perspective, um, uh, because this can actually really take away time to provide actual services that we know that help. And then, of course, really removing a lot of these um, 
uh, these bureaucratic barriers for patients in terms of getting appropriately paid uh, time to uh, meet, meet the needs as it relates to their conditions. Um, this is my researcher hat. We have to do better around uh, how we're collecting data around LGBTQ folks, particularly LGBTQ folks of color and people with disabilities. Um, the NSHD, I was asked after they had uh, designed all this, I was very much happy to be part of the team. We, I'm, we're still all pushing myself and a few other researchers um, across the country are really trying to revise the gender question to be to, to more accurately uh, capture um, uh, gender identity for all folks, um, making sure that it's not just also this other category, which literally is othering folks, um, which is very unpleasant to say the least. Um, and then of course, reducing uh, uh, the policing of bodies. Um, and this is something that does come through in healthcare. And this is what, something that has come through a little bit in some of our qualitative data about how people are treated in the healthcare system as it relates to their perceived, as, as to how people read their bodies, both around race, ethnicity, but also around disability. Um, I wanted to make sure there was time for Q&A. Um, I also want to highlight um, Noah Kurth, who is our amazing, um, uh, one of the amazing researchers that we work with um, at University of Kansas. This is their information. If you'd like to learn more about collaborating, you will also have access to these slides. So you'll have all these uh, hyperlinks and emails. Um, but yeah, we can stop here for Q&A. And I want to make sure, hopefully I wasn't talking too fast. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was really interesting research, um, really great work. We do have a couple of questions. So I'll start with um, a follow-up around the data. Do you have data comparing rates of assessing healthcare services of insured SGM versus insured non-SGM? Great, so like how often they actually are accessing care. Um, we do have some, so we do have some questions for that as a, in the next wave. Uh, we did not have it for this data. I think that's a really good question. Um, I mean, naturally there are more questions in the next wave because of the focus on how the pandemic has affected people's ability to access that care, particularly as it relates to telehealth and the like. So we'll have more information around that. We did not have it uh, fully for this, uh, for this last, uh, for the wave that I'm presenting. Um, because I mean, it's a good question in terms of how often are people accessing care um, and how, I mean, how often, are, not only how often are people accessing care, how often are they able to access care when they need it? Um, uh, because even if somebody is accessing care, quote unquote, more often than the general population, is that actually still the amount of access they need? Um, there definitely um, are certain situations where somebody needs to be able to access care more often than the once a year or once quarterly. Great. Thank you. I have a caregiving question for you. Yeah. Our health care system tr tends to rely heavily on um, carers in the home to provide people help. Wondering if there are any data on family unpaid informal caregiving in LGBTQ plus population. So yeah, so this is a great question, um, and this is this is not something that we can answer within the NSHD. But um, I know I know a number of researchers are looking into this, particularly as it relates to older adults. Um, there's some work done by um, uh, Jason Flat out of University of Nevada, looking at caregiver experiences for people living with um, dementia and disability as it relates to aging. Um, I know there are. So yes, there, there's more research happening. It is still new um, in my opinion, because I feel like the, the one, the field of LGBTQ health broadly only re really recently has started to get more funded beyond strictly HIV. Um, HIV research is really important. Um, it definitely is the bulk of what the NIH uh, funds as it relates to LGBTQ health still even today. Uh, but more, um, more opportunities do exist um, for looking at these other population level questions as it relates to disability, caregiver, caregiver fatigue and support, um, and a number of other chronic conditions. Myself, I focus around cardiovascular health and cancer preventive services, which were not the focus for a long time. Um, so to, to the question is, yes, it is out there. I do not have that data on hand right now to, I don't want to quote anything off the top of my head because I would just be pulling numbers out of thin air. Thank you. And again, please, if anybody else have any comments or questions, please enter them in the Q&A. Um, Carl, you had said there were some interesting points when you were presenting the data that you wanted to go back to if we had time at the end. Um, do you want to touch on? Yeah, so I want to, 
Um, actually, I'm just going to, I think I'm just going to exit out of here because I don't have the slide. Um, the big issue here with any research is the quality of the data. Um, and well, I think the, the National Survey on Health and Disability is a, a remarkable step forward in us being able to look at the intersection of identities as it relates to the experience of disability in the U.S. and the U.S. healthcare system. Um, I, I have major issues with the gender question. Um, and I we did our own report, and this is my own critique of the, <laughs> the work that I led, is we everybody's grouped together. And this doesn't allow us to really look at the different experiences of people based on different sexual identities, different gender identities. Um, and everything gets kind of conflated together. Yes, we did see a signal uh, when we grouped everybody together in terms of broadly, all, uh, when we look at all LGBTQ folks compared to all straight cisgender folks, that, um, uh, that they are having issues, that they are having uh, issues as they self-report. But that doesn't let me know, is, there, is this happening more often for bisexual folks? Is this happening more often for trans individuals? Is this happening more often for non-binary folks? Because when we, when we are able to, when we do have that data where we're actually able to be more granular and closer and more closely approximate people's identity, we do see big differences even within, within these, uh, these specific sexual identity and gender identity categories. Um, some of my own early work looking at the behavioral respect of surveillance system uh, for a long time, for a long time, everybody was either looking at only trans men and trans women or looking at everybody together. When we looked at their category for non-binary, non-binary individuals fared even worse than trans binary folks. Um, and that gets lost when we group everybody together. Um, so it, it's one of those things where population research needs to ask and allow folks to answer questions in such a way that allows us to be as precise as possible. Um, uh, it's, it, for me, like it's the phrase, like I like to say, like it's our, it's our way of trying to meet, like live up to the promise of precision medicine. Living up to the promise of precision population statistics requires us to ask better questions. Um, and that, those questions need to be com community informed. Um, I um, love working with the folks at, uh, within the NSHD, um, uh, but it is like me and a few other uh, folks in the past few years who are really trying to remind them of how, how to be doing these questions. Thank you. Do you have plans to focus research on the intersection of LGBTQ identities, disabilities, and COVID-19? So yes, so we have the next wave of data um, from 2021. Um, so they've finished their collection. We are beginning to look at what some of those experiences are as it relates to the pandemic. A lot of the same stuff that we were asking before, but also specific to um, being able to access telehealth services, being able to access in-person services, being able to get tested when you feel you need to get tested, because that's definitely played out a lot more in terms of who's able to access even the, ba uh, the basics of COVID testing. Uh, let alone uh, vaccination. Because um, we do know some earlier data from places like uh, Kaiser Permanente, um, the Kaiser Family Foundation, the um, Tegan and Sarah Foundation, that broadly LGBTQ populations actually wanted these services more and actually wanted to be vaccinated earlier um, and, more, and were more willing to be vaccinated for community benefit, let alone individual benefits. So that's some stuff that we'll be able to tease out from uh, this next wave as well. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that with I don't, so I don't know exactly how many uh, folks have completed this latest wave, but I'm hoping we can also begin to tease apart some additional um, intersecting identities and experiences, um, since this is still, as you uh, probably saw early on, still an overwhelmingly white sample. Um, I would rather, uh, I'd rather be trying to figure out ways to better uh, incorporate the voices of multiple marginalized individuals, um, since that is always such a, a big issue in the U.S. healthcare system, yeah. and I mean, in life in general. <laughs> Great. Yes. Thank you. I have an, a question, another question. How can we advocate for the disaggregation of gender identity data when the field of research has historically relied on binary coded variables? While we have more technology now to better capture data, I personally have encountered resistance from seasoned, seasoned researchers who use a binary framework. Uh, I mean, this is such a great question because this is like this is like part of my life and trying to, trying to um, politely update or just like destroy, <laughs> destroy old uh, research uh, data fields. Um, I'm trying to like the best way to approach this. One, so there's one, there's a lot of work that's done around highlighting the limitations of what does exist right now. So for example, there are, there are algorithms out there that 
try to identify trans folks in, in data sets where gender identity is not an option. So, okay, do they have a diagnosis as it relates to their trans identity? Uh, does, are they receiving prescriptions and so forth? And then it categorizes them into binary identities. Um, um, some of the work that I'm doing is showing that when you actually use this algorithm in a setting where people actually can provide their own self-identity, that it's misclassifying a lot of folks, particularly non-binary identities. So um, some of the first steps in trying to update stuff is really showing folks how, what's happening when they're doing this wrong. Um, doing that concurrently, um, uh, you need to actually make sure you bring in community voices and recognize that there are people with lived experience who are experts in the field. There are trans identified researchers who are telling you how to do it and they've demonstrated how to do it well. Um, so uh, listening to them, citing their work and really bringing them in and collaborating with them uh, to really update these fields, I think is a large part of that. Um, and then, I mean, ultimately at some point, if you can uh, gather the resources, doing it yourself and doing it better um, and people will follow that kind of example. Um, I do appreciate that, again, a lot of careerists within the federal government have released uh, recommendations, have released at least a sampling of like, these are all the questions as it relates to sexual orientation, gender identity, and showing where the context, where they've been used and how they've been used and the limitations. Um, and there's actually a new, um, there's a new uh, funded initiative called Project Recognize uh, run uh, out of Northwestern University in Chicago that is going to be reevaluating all the SOGI questions, discussing all the limitations, having community involvement in terms of discussing limitations and revising, providing recommendations for how to do this better. Um, and I, sh I share that since I'm one of the uh, co-eyes on that. Um, that is still years away. Um, in the meantime, we should still be doing better. We should still be listening to community. Um, and for researchers who don't want to hear it, um, I hesitate to work with folks who don't want to more approximately, uh, uh, better approximate what's happening within communities. Oh, and I mean, we didn't talk about it here, but I, I, um, there's been so much research showing that people, and the researchers sometimes are afraid to update, or they, they say they're afraid to update because they don't want to offend folks, they don't want people to drop off of surveys and so forth. People are less willing to tell you their income than their sexual orientation um, in research. Like, like ten percent of folks will drop off if you ask them what their income versus like one percent of folks uh, will drop off if you ask their sexual orientation. And that's across all age groups um, and um, all sexual identities. Um, and similar work has been done looking at when people drop off surveys in the behavioral risk factor surveillance system, again, way more common when they're asked income than when they're asked sexual orientation or gender identity. So again, if people say, oh, I feel, I think that's gonna make people feel uncomfortable. I'm like, sounds like you might be sitting with your own discomfort around these questions. This is not a reflection of what people actually are willing to tell you. Great, thank you. So again, we do have a few more minutes left. So I invite um, folks to share any comments or questions. Um, naturally, if, if there are questions people have um, uh, after the fact and don't want to share here, you can always email me um, at uh, cjstreed at bu.edu. I'm happy to answer questions there as well. Um, actually, I'll put my slide back up just because that showed it. Mm -hmm. Or my BMC email as well. Uh, Those of us who are interested in this work, um, you know, how could, you know, do you have any recommendations on how we can, you know, better advocate um, in, in our current roles? I know you did put up some recommendations at the, at the end. I mean, those yep. systemic, Broad. Huge, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think, I think you're all way ahead of the curve in terms of actually having uh, dedicated resources for employee resource groups to make sure that people actually have a chance to gather, talk, and actually really uh, start to identify friction points and pain points within institutions. Um, I feel like there needs to be a more, um, we have to really imagine, like be more empathetic and imagine what the patient experience is. Um, and we've been doing this, at least within our own center as it relates to gender affirming care, like all the instances where somebody can be mis misgendered that while not intentional, the system has built that in. Like, I mean, all the different ways in which um, people interface with the systems that we've created, we have to imagine what that is like for people with varying um, accessibilities and so forth. Uh, that, that requires 
time and person person um, uh, uh, resources in terms of actually paying for people's uh, time to really think about that. Um, and this is where I think also patients um, and community advisory boards, and I, I make the di distinction, patients are the people who you're already serving, who already access your services. Community can include that, but more than likely it might be people who are like, no, we don't access your services for X, Y, Z reasons. And you wanna know why those, what those reasons are. Um, and that's, I think those are uh, great ways to make sure you're actually hearing folks um, uh, through all of this. Thank you. Um, and I mean, and also I, Mount Sinai is a, a great academic institution as well. So really highlighting how is this being taught to trainee students and trainees really needs to be more explicit. I know we always talk about the hidden curriculum. Um, I mean, that's something I heard about decades ago in my own training. I mean, yes, great. We keep on hearing about it. So what's explicitly being done to make sure that students and trainees do not um, uh, continue the same cycles of trauma as it relates to uh, sexual and gender identity as and disability and access. Great, great points. Thank you for sharing that. I have one last question, um, unless something else comes up in the okay. queue. How do you practice self-care <laughs> in, in all the work that you're doing and in the pandemic? And that is a that is a load of questions. Self care. I count down the days to the week I'm taking off for Thanksgiving, which is nine days. Um, no, so, so, so I think self care is very personalized. I think people. Um, I think that's always recognizing what brings you joy, what brings you energy, and what rejuvenates you. Um, but that that requires the ability to have that time and the resources. And one, I'm very privileged. I am like I'm an assistant professor in an organization that does value my work, and I'm I am supported. But yes, there's a lot of a lot of stuff that competes for time. I find joy in the work, and know that if I have to take time off to take care of myself, there are other people I work with who take care of that work as well. Um, and I like to think of this as a much larger mission around advocacy and improving health and well-being and allowing people to thrive. And the way I, I think about this is as kind of like a choir. So like a music choir can hold a note indefinitely, a group of people singing can hold a note indefinitely because when one person takes a breath, everybody else is still holding the note. So you never, you never hear that one person is taking a break while everybody else is singing. And that's the same way I, I try to approach this work in a collaborative environment where I can step back, take care of myself, do what I need to, um, and everybody else is carrying that. So you don't feel this guilt for taking time off. Um, so I, I always encourage folks to be more collaborative. Um, that's, that allows me the space to think about ways for self-care. And self-care, of course, for me is physical movement, lo loving my cats, loving my plants, loving my husband, um, and uh, getting outdoors as often as possible. Wonderful, thank you. I just had a question pop up. Uh, thank you for putting this question in. How can we make clinicians with no lived LGBT plus experience more empathetic during interpersonal interactions with patients? Have you observed any particular impactful strategies? Oh, that's a good question. Um, the, the tough last question, uh, because I mean, we're still trying to, we're, we're still trying to figure this out across multiple uh, marginal identity, marginalized identities uh, in the US, not just sexual and gender. But what have I, what, what I've seen well is really trying to appeal to people's humanity um, and, and trying to remind folks that they themselves have a sexual and gender identity and really talking them through the ways in which that helps or hinders their navigation through society. And now try and imagine that for somebody who is in, has an identity that society has treated less than frequently, always. Um, so trying to play, trying to really appeal to people's empathy is a large part of it. Um, there is a component of reminding folks that there is something to be said around um, punitive action if there is a negative encounter. <laughs> um, recognizing that patient satisfaction is a really, patient satisfaction and happiness and feeling welcome is a large part of their ability to trust the healthcare system and then engage in the care recommendations uh, that we provide. Um, so trying to remind people of that. I, I must say, I haven't seen a whole lot, I haven't seen a whole lot specific that is guaranteed to change somebody's mind or guaranteed to really open things up. Um, it's almost always, it always, it feels like it, for me, it feels like it always takes an actual conversation with somebody from that, with that lived experience, um, which is why um, I don't expect everybody to be out. Um, but if you feel safe and comfortable being out, being out actually allows people to um, recognize that 
there are other people who are not like them out there who they need to care for. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we could have a long conversation about this. And I, again, I don't have like a good, easy answer, straightforward answer for this. Um, it's still something we're trying to figure out. Um, I mean, man, if we had the answer, I would be, I'd, that'd be like half my job done and I'd appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, we'd love to have you come back and present more of your work um, next year. Um, so thank you so much for taking the time to share um, your research with us. Excellent. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I, I greatly appreciate it. it was, uh, I must say it was, it was fun uh, to have some friends at Mount Sinai saying like, are you coming to talk? I'm just like, oh, I don't know. I don't know who she is. I, I just... <laughs> <laughs> so thank you again. Yeah. And I wanted to let everybody know that um, I have your emails from the registration. So once I have the recording, I will share the recording and I will also get a copy of the PowerPoint, um, which I will share um, as well. So just give us a few days to get that together. And also, if you are interested in joining any of our ERGs, please email us at diversity at Mount Sinai .org. Um, The ADAPT ERG and the LGBTQ ERG um, were the sponsors for today's webinar. Um, so thank you to everybody who attended and we'll see you all soon. Thank you.